Jasper at St. Louis University Law School. He's also KTRS's legal analyst, and more importantly, he's one heck of a nice man. Good morning, Greg Willard. Good morning, McGraw Good morning. and Kelly. How you doing? In the state of Missouri, we do not want a prescription uh, opioid list because that gives the government too much access. We don't want to have a real ID that the federal government wants because, by golly, we don't want the government to know too much about us. And now the federal government <laughs> is asking for the police officers to look at our phone GPS whenever they want without our approval. Yes. What's going on? What's going on is uh, welcome the framers of our Constitution of the 21st century. Yes. Overall. What what happened in this instance with a cell phone is a gentleman, Timothy Carpenter, in, uh, in Michigan or Ohio, I think it was, committed a series of armed robberies, uh, was charged, convicted, and sentenced to 116 years. Okay. One of the critical pieces of information was that the government was able to get his cell phone records, which show roughly where he was when certain calls were made. Well, they triangulated right. 127 days worth of where he was, cell phone information, and showed that to the jury, connected them to the location of the armed robbery, armed robberies, and he was convicted. He said, Your Honor, that's a search under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. The government did not have a search warrant to get that information right. from my cell phone provider. Therefore, I should not be convicted. The court disagreed. It went to the Court of Appeals. It disagreed and said, you don't need a search warrant. And in about an hour, the United States Supreme Court is going to take up the issue. Mm -hmm. So the question, McGraw, is to get that, that, I'll call it GPS data, but to get that cell phone location data, which is being collected as you and right. Kelly and I are sitting here. Right. They're, it's, they're collecting data on us as to our location. Does the government need a search warrant to get that or is it like bank records or your phone record as to whom you dialed a number right you don't have the supreme court has said you don't have to have a search warrant for that or is it somewhere in the middle that well you don't need a search warrant but you need to do a little bit more than just serve a subpoena and say give it to me so many things come to mind first of all let's talk about the the constant argument of um what you lawyers like to contend <laughs> is the 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 original framers um right what how yeah. are you supposed to as a supreme court justice it being a good conservative justice say hmm I'm an originalist, which means whatever they thought 250 years ago, by golly, I'm going to apply that today. How do you fit that square peg into this round hole? Uh, you, you have emulated the late Justice Scalia very well, McGraw. Uh, being an originalist, that's exactly what he, the question he would pose this morning in the, in the courtroom. And that is, if we take this 21st century technology and apply it to 1789, what what would the framers have thought? And I think what Scalia would have said is they would have analogized it to a horse and buggy. That if someone is standing in the public square and Kelly goes by in a horse and buggy, they can report and they can testify and they can be compelled to testify that they saw Kelly in the town square in a horse and buggy. What they can't uh, compel testimony without a search warrant is was she right if she wrote something while in the, the buggy, the content? So what I think Scalia would say is, well, analogizing to 1789, what was said in that cell phone call by Mr. Carpenter, you're going to have to get a search warrant to get that. Mm -hmm. But where he was and the data that his cell phone collected, where he right. was right. in 1789, you don't need a search warrant. However... You're in that horse and buggy that has a cover on it. Can you stop that horse and buggy and look for Greg Willard? Uh, Arbitrarily. No, you cannot You cannot stop the buggy and look for right. Greg Willard. Well, and right. that's the question. Is this cell phone technology, are you looking under the hood? Or are you just looking out and gazing out at the stars? Right. And what the prosecution will say, the, the prosecution, the federal government will say in about an hour to the Supreme Court is, uh, just like when you... You give a, a 
uh, bit of information to your bank, you don't have an expectation of privacy as to, as to that information, and you certainly don't own it. And so a cell phone owner in the 21st century, the government will say this morning, doesn't have an expectation that those GPS coordinates will be kept private, mm. and therefore a search warrant is not required. Um, Google knows where we all are. But they know us as XJ59721. Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily know Greg Willard is sitting in the studio, right? I mean, they don't. They don't. They they know, but they don't know in a sense, right? Yes. Um, so in that sense, they were looking for this guy, and they triangulated this guy specifically for this. Unlike taking massive data to figure out where the slowdown is on Highway 40. Right. What they they knew where the robberies, these multiple Radio Shack and T-Mobile robberies, yeah. armed robberies had taken place, and so they they went in and they got the the phone GPS coordinates for 127 days with with respect to a number of people. It wasn't just Mr. Carpenter. It was a number of people. Right. And then they narrowed it down, and they they were able then to. Uh, triangulate, if you will, with Mr. Carpenter. I'll give you quickly another example. Several years ago, a federal judge was uh, the subject of an assassination attempt at his home. Okay. And the FBI went out and looked at cell phone records, GPS records, not because they knew who did it, just the opposite. They didn't know who had done it, but they began to to use triangulation to eliminate people, to eliminate possible suspects, right. and ultimately solve the case. Had they been required to get a search warrant, the FBI would say, mm-hmm. we never would have found the person because we wouldn't have, have had probable cause to get a search warrant to go get that GPS information. Right. So it's a lower, what the FBI and the government want is they want a much lower showing to go to the phone company and say, we need McGraw's cell phone records for the last 120 days as to his cell phone location. Right. It's interesting because the conservatives are sort of twisting themselves in a knot over this. Some of them, right, don't want real ID cards because they don't want the government to know anything about them on one hand. But on the other hand, they want access to our GPS? Oh, it's the the uh, it's the beauty of modern tech, the political bedfellows that modern technology brings about. Right. Because the, the law and order... Um, uh, proponents would say, well, by God, if it helps us solve the crime, let's get it. Well, within that same orbit are a lot of people who hold dear the privacy right at the core of the Fourth Amendment. Right. And there is a, a very large tension there between privacy rights, the Fourth Amendment, and by God, let's get tough and let's have law and order. Right. Explain to me how this works. He He was convicted... He appealed. He lost the appeal. He brought it up the chain of command. It sounds like he lost every single step of the way. So yes. why did the Supreme Court take this case if all the other courts below them are in agreement? The, uh, the Supreme Court, the last 10 years, McGraw, in the criminal case, has been very troubled by modern technology and the constitutional issues that it raises. For example, affixing a GPS locator to someone's automobile. Mm. Um, that went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said to do that, you have to have a search warrant. A police officer just can't come up and stick a GPS monitor on the back of your car. Okay. Need a search warrant for that. Chief Justice Roberts, in particular, has been troubled by the constitutional issues of technology, and Justice Sotomayor uh, is very troubled by it in that back in the 70s, there, were the bank, there was the bank records uh, case and the phone pins that – Whatever number you dialed, you don't, the, the government doesn't need a search warrant to get that from the phone company. And what Justice Sotomayor has said, we need to take a step back pre-1976, the Smith and Miller cases, and look at this with fresh eyes. Chief Justice Roberts may not go that far, but he is very troubled by the constitutional issues of technology. You bundle that all up, right. here comes Mr. Carpenter's case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know what? We're going to take a look at this as to GPS location data. 
What uh, you're a court watcher? How do you think this turns out? Yeah. I think in the end, Mr. Uh, unfortunately for Mr. Carpenter, he's going to spend the next 116 <laughs> years in prison. Uh. I, I think he's going to lose. I think what the the court will do is they'll give us a little more clarity, but. Uh, I think the, the benchmarks will probably continue to be if the government wants data that is on your device, they will need a search warrant. If the government wants data that your cell phone provider maintains, probably, I, I'm predicting, the court won't require, will not require a search warrant for that, but it will continue to require a higher showing than just give it to So me. what you're saying is the government doesn't have access to my email. They just are allowed to know where I wrote it. They, they, I think that's a, a fair analogy. They, they're not, back to the, the example I gave with Kelly and the buggy, they're not entitled to know the content of that communication, but the, but the, the route that it took they're entitled to get that. That's Greg Willard, and that is uh, at least uh, three credits on your <laughs> semester courses for uh, your law degree. While I have you, I was reading on um, 538.com. They had an article um, about Chief Justice Roberts becoming more liberal. Is that a conversation in law circles these, these days? Uh, no, and the reason uh, be, is because I think his jurisprudence is, is pretty firm, I think that the genesis of this, uh, he's becoming more liberal, is uh, largely attributable to his vote on the Affordable Care Act, right. Obamacare, right. That, that, where he said, well, it's, they, they said it's not a tax, but I'm going to call it a tax, and he was the fifth vote to uphold it. Right. So I think people uh, construe from that, well, then he's getting more liberal. Right. I, I, I don't think that's a fair, uh, fair assumption. He, he, I don't think he was quite as ideologically conservative as, say, Justice Alito and Justice Scalia, right. but he is certainly uh, not uh, uh, ideological bedfellows with Justice Breyer or Justice Ginsburg. There you go. Uh, Greg Willard, always a pleasure. Thanks. Good stuff. Good to be with you, my friend. Really interesting stuff. You know, I would have liked law school if if I got a guarantee I, he was I my was teacher every day. I was listening. I mean, I'm actually understanding it. Right? I would have loved law school if, yes. if they weren't, you know, if they're all nice guys, unlike the, uh, the jerks most of the law, <laughs> law professors.